truth. Tonight we're going to consider the subject, uh, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly. And it's the study of Sodom, it's the story of, uh, of Lot, but really it's the story of today. Because this is the situation. We read in Luke chapter 17 and verse 28, Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So that's the situation. It's the time period of AD 70 that the Lord is talking about here, but it parallels very closely our time period, the time period of, of Noah, the time period of Lot. We live in a very, very similar age. If we think of Noah, Genesis 6, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And that was before the world wide web of iniquity that basically pervades every facet of society today. Corruption is on a scale that has never been seen before, I'll, I'll put it to you, in the history of the world because of the access to information. So it's for that reason that the society of the day was destroyed. It was rotten to the core. Now the same is also true when it comes to the time of Gomorrah and of Sodom. Yahweh said in Genesis 18 verse 20, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, and it shall come unto me, and if not, I will know. And so when the angels came to, uh, to Abraham to tell him this is what they were going to do, Abraham was distressed that the ecclesia that had separated from him and that had gone down with Lot into Sodom had been decimated. And it's amazing, brothers and sisters, when we see that, that the city of the day was a city of great violence, of great immorality, and it's because of that that God records for us, basically, the intent of the men of Sodom. He gives it to us very clearly. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 to 7, when the angels came, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men that came to you this night? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. Lot also went out to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, do, or don't do this wicked thing. And so that was the situation of the day. Very similar to the time in which we live. In fact, I would put it to you that it's fairly unparalleled um, in its um, immorality in the world we live in today. The sin of Sodom, though, is given to us when we come to look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. And uh, it's in verse uh, 49 and 50. Behold, this is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. And the last thing that's mentioned is the committing of abomination. Everything else preceding it is just fullness of bread, pride, idleness, all those kinds of things that we see in the world around us today, a commonplace. And when we look at the world today, do we see pride? Well, absolutely we do. You know, it's, it's all over the place. Um, we've seen this phenomenon develop over the past 20 years, these pride parades, celebrating abhorrent behavior before God. And we see them all over the place. In every city and country, this is in Toronto, right close to where I live, um, gay pride marches happen all the time, and instead of, you know, the, the acts that these people commit being illegal and considered to be abomination, it's celebrated by world leaders. This is Canada's Prime Minister out here in front, Justin Trudeau, in front leading this gay pride parade. And uh, we have uh, another opposition leader, he's a Sikh, a uh, totally different faith. Uh, Justin Trudeau would be Roman Catholic, this is a Sikh, and he is also celebrating this same thing. But it's not just political leaders. Uh, the, the message is you can be gay and be Christian too. This is all pervasive in society. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see how it's justified. Here's a, a gay priest. Jesus had two dads and he turned out all right. I mean, this is kind of the reasoning that is going on. 
And so you have Anglicans involved in this, proud Anglicans. Um, you have uh, uh, proud, um, well, this is the Anglicans again. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Obviously, they never read Romans. Um, shall we sin that grace may abound? But the Bible has nothing to do with these religions anymore. They just put the whole thing aside. Washington National Cathedral. So here you have it in the United States as well. Catholics for equality, for lesbian, gay, and whatever the other things are there. And it goes on and on and on. Roman Catholic parishes, um, Presbyterians. Again, these people have just never read Romans or Corinthians to see this is what God has to say about this. Or if they have, they completely and absolutely ignore it or treat it as allegorical or as an hyperbole. And um, they just believe, you know, that we should welcome and affirm uh, Baptists of all different colors and shapes and stripes. Um, even the Mormons getting involved and, uh, and even the Jews. So every type of religion as all seems to be embracing this, any group that speaks out is marginalized and spoken against. Um, and it's being embraced by the world as the new morality. And it's really, really quite distressing. And it's interesting because it's a pride parade. And just the very use of the word pride when it comes to a biblical context is amazing. Because Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 tells us the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do i hate so that's god's take on this he does not like it in fact he hates it pride arrogancy and the evil way and yet the world celebrates it right to the highest levels even the pope himself has said if a person is gay and seeks the lord and is of good will who am i to judge him no mention of of repentance or changing one's ways or turning away from it just it's okay whatever you are come along and we'll accept that never mind what God thinks about it and so that's the world that we live in and really it's it's a complete changing around from what is right to what is wrong we read here woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light to darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And that is the world in which we live. But that was also the world in which Lot lived. It was a hostile world. A world that was very hostile to him. In fact, the people hated Lot for his stand against their morality. And it's interesting. I'd just like you to turn over to Peter, Second of Peter, because this is where we have in Second of Peter a, a, a divine comment on this. And it's chapter 2, and we have the discussion that's taking place here on the situation that was going on in the day. Second of Peter, chapter 2, and um, helps if I'm in Second Peter. Yeah, Second Peter, chapter 2, and coming in at verse 6, we read there that this is what God did. He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample of those who should live ungodly. And he delivers just Lot, who is vexed with the filthy conversation or the lifestyle of the wicked. But that man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And that word vexed is an interesting word. The word basically has the idea there of to test or to torture, to distress, to fight or struggle, like struggling with a headwind. So if you're trying to like, you know, canoe on a lake and you're canoeing right into the wind and the wind is blowing on you, this is the kind of struggle that Lot had with this wicked world. And it's a world that alienated itself from God and God calls them wicked. He doesn't call them alternative lifestyle, a choice. He just says, this is the wicked. Now the challenge for Lot though, was that he was seeing and he was hearing these things. So they were filthy. The world word means unbridled lust. And it was an unbridled lust in their manner of life or behavior, which is the word uh, conversation. And this is the idea that gives to us. They saw it, they looked at and glanced, or, or Lot did, and he heard it. He listened to these things. And so they were entering into his senses. And they were struggling with the world in which he lived. And brothers and sisters, we have to ask the question, young people, well, how about us? Do we struggle with it? 
does it offend us anymore? Or are we just kind of like, oh, that's just the way they are? Um, do we find this a challenge to us and something that is repugnant because it's repugnant to our God? Well, the thing is, if we're seeing and hearing these things, um, there's actually never been an age on any part of the planet where the hearing of anything has been so possible. You can listen to absolutely anything from any of the four quarters of the earth in hearing by whatever method you choose to engage in. But it's also in seeing, because the World Wide Web is there for us and provides us with all kinds of access to information. It's an unparalleled time when images from all over the world can instantly pipe into our brains. Now, it doesn't matter if we're feeling strong one day or maybe not so strong another day, or maybe we're not even looking for it and it finds us. It's there and it's on the internet. And this whole thing of seeing, you know, it doesn't stop. I mean, it used to be if you didn't have a TV, a lot of the stuff was cut out, but it's there now, whether it's YouTube or Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever service of the day is out there available to us. It's all streaming in. And of course, it's a constant challenge to our faith into who we are. And we have to be real about it. We can't pretend that these things aren't there. We can't pretend that we don't live in the days of Lot and then the days of Noah when these challenges are there in front of us. They are there. And in fact, the world recognizes that seeing is a big problem. These are magazines. You've got Time magazine, and it describes it as the pornography plague. You know, cyber porn, the secret web, the dangers of growing up online. These are things that are there. The world even looks at it and says, this is a problem. This is a huge problem for young people. It's a problem for kids who haven't even hit teenage years yet because the accessibility is so rampant out there. Even the world recognizes that. And the words of the Lord Jesus Christ have to kind of come home. Where he says in Matthew 5, verse 28, I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not, and that thy whole, should, uh, should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So the grave will devour us if we allow ourselves to be overtaken by these things. And we might say, look, we're not involved in the acts of the people of Lot's day. We don't participate in the pride marches. We don't involve ourselves in those things. But if we're seeing and hearing them, and they're entering into our minds and into our hearts, and they're causing that response that we're looking to lust, it's the same thing. And it is a real challenge today. Lot was surrounded by that filthy conversation of the wicked. And just here's what it means. It's immoral. It's willful excess. It's unbridled lust. It's shamelessness. It's self-indulgence. It's depravity. That's what the world was like. That's his day. And I don't need to tell you that that is our day as well. It's all the way through the world, all the way around us. And it's seeing and hearing that vexed him. And again, the word means to be tested, to be tortured, to be distressed, to fight, to struggle with something. And I'll put it to young people, if you haven't struggled with this already, you will. Because it's all around you. It's everywhere present. And it doesn't matter if you're young or if you're older. As an arranging brother, you, you realize that all kinds of brothers and sisters are struggling with the world around us because we live in the days of Lot and seeing and hearing what goes on around us and what accessible to us vexes us. It distresses us, it tortures us, and we fight and we struggle against it. See, the thing is, what is wrong with the world today is there's absolute confusion of mind as to what God has created and the way that things should be. People have rejected God's word completely, and so consequently, we live in a day similar to the judges, when everybody does what is right in his own eyes. Judges 21 and verse 25. Now that's the phrase that capitalizes that period of Alcana 
going up to the tabernacle, and Hophni and Phinehas were just having their way with the women who came up to the tabernacle. That's the situation in Judges, and that's the situation today. This is what the humanists have to say. Humanists make sense of the world using reason, experience, and shared values. We seek to make the best of the one life we have, in other words, live for the moment, by creating meaning and purpose for ourselves. So, as humanists, we just write our own rules. Whatever works for us, we're going to do what is right in our own eyes. That's the world around us. And yet God says, look, O oh Yahweh, I know that the, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah recognized that. You can't come up with the right sort of way to go about things ourselves. God recognizes that man doesn't know how to do that because we have a core problem. Now the humanists go on. Secular humanists, we believe in the central importance of the value of human happiness here and now. That's the God they serve, is human happiness here and now. We are opposed to absolute morality, yet we maintain that objective standards emerge. So they're evolutionists. Ethical values and principles may be discovered in the course of ethical deliberation. So we're going to discover morality. We're going to create our own values. And we reject that there is a God and any absolute morality that might be out there. It's absolute nonsense, but that's the world. You cannot tell it anything. It knows best, and it's going to tell you. A life, the life stance of humanism, guided by reason, inspired by compassion, informed by experiencing experience, encourage us to live life well and fully. It evolved through the ages and continues to develop through the efforts of thoughtful people who recognize the value of ideals, however carefully wrought, are subject to change as our knowledge and understandings advance. And I don't know what it's like in the schools around here, but boy, are things are changing. In my son's school, that thankfully he's out of now, the principal would not hand out one of the awards on graduation day to a young girl who had advocated to add a third set of washrooms in the school for those who can't decide whether they're girls or boys, they're transgender. And so, you know, she got a, a, a great award and the principal had fought against this and said, this is just not right. And so he obviously did not give this award out. It was given by one of the other staff, but that goes right into the schools. It's in the workplace and it's just the way that the world is. And they don't see it as wrong. They see it as right. They see it as, as perfectly acceptable. And, and, you know, on some level, you feel sorry for them because they just don't know any better anymore. There just is no uh, moral compass whatsoever. Well, this is what God has to say about this. He says, look, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. That's what Paul says about, about it. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. It is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they're vain. So when it comes to the Bible, when it verses human reasoning, this is what Paul says. The wise people in this world are fools. They're idiots. They're absolute morons, really, is kind of what the word means. It's morose, moronous, right? It means literally they're stupid. Because they don't know, but they profess to know. And it's just not true. So, truth, as far as the humanist is concerned, is just a creation. Educators, we read, are biased. Facilitators. And constructors of knowledge. So, knowledge is something that you construct. It's not something you learn. You just make it up. Um, it's, it, if all reality exists, not out there, but only in the minds of those who perceive it, then no one can claim authority. All versions of truth are merely human creations. The knowledge constructed by learners, teachers, or scientists are all of equal worth. So if Einstein were sitting here, and I had a grade 9 chemistry or physics student, and the grade 9 chemistry or physics student came up with some theory, according to this, it's of equal weight to Einstein. Or maybe Sir Isaac Newton, or somebody like that. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But that's what you're learning about today. Well, that's what the education system, or really the humanist engine behind it, is really all about. And pity those who have to work in this. 
You have to deal with this kind of thing and try and navigate around it. It's a tough go. We have it certainly in the workplace. We have it in our health and safety laws and the way we're supposed to treat people and all those kinds of things. Um, and it certainly is there in, in mass in the schools. But what does God tell us? Well, the Proverbs in chapter 3 tell us to trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So that's what we want is a God-directed life, not a life that is directed by the world around us. And so we're told in Corinthians, the natural man will not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness to him. And if some of the verses I've read to you seem like jarring, that's your natural man that's being jarred. That's the man or woman that has been to school or work and has heard that it's okay and this is acceptable and this is the way that we should operate today. It's not the way God works. The natural man cannot receive the counsel of God, cannot receive the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the world out there that has not the truth at all doesn't stand a chance when it comes to fathoming a subject like we have before us tonight. But even ourselves, if we let that natural reasoning kind of take over, it's going to be a tough road to hoe. It's going to be a tough thing to dig through because if we let the natural man rather than the spiritual man take hold of our thoughts, it's going to, we're going to be repudiated by what God says in the Bible. We're going to find that it just jars us. It just doesn't feel good because it's not what we hear in the world. And then it comes a question, well, who do we believe? Do we believe the world or do we believe God? And that really is the issue, is it not? Right to the very beginning. What does the serpent say? Hath God said? It's the first question in the Bible. Flesh questions the word of God. And what does it lead to? Death. They knew the truth, but they chose the wrong way. And young people and brothers and sisters, we know that. Many times we know what God wants us to do, but we choose the wrong way because that's our nature. The natural man will not receive the spirit, things of the Spirit. So in Lot's day, really that's what was going on. It was all about rebellion. And the world we live in is broken. And in many ways, it is far beyond repair, just like his situation was. Are we made that way? Well, that's what the world would argue today. In all of its celebrities, top to bottom, bottom you've got Ellen DeGeneres, um, you've got Time Magazine here, the battle over gay teens, um, this whole idea of transgender. I mean, these are the issues that are pushed to the forefront in all the media. And one of those arguments is, is we're actually made that way. In fact, there was a Time magazine, I only had a black and white copy of it at home, that talked about the genetic gene, the gay gene, that, that we just are, that's the way we are. We can't help it. But it's not true, brothers and sisters and young people. It is absolutely not true. Think of what God says. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. Let's just turn this one up. We've got it on the screen, but take a look at it in your own Bible. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. This is the argument of the, of the Apostle Paul about this whole situation. For this reason, he says, about this, this era, God gave them up to their dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that were contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion one for another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And that's the, the uh, ESV. It's not natural. We're not born that way. It is against nature. Homosexuality is not a genetic predisposition more than any other lust of the flesh is. Because that's what it is. It's a lust of the flesh. Now, if I had a pred predilection to, let's say, um, let's pick another fear. What would it be? Kleptomania. Okay. You know, I, kleptomania is somebody just wants to steal. They just love to steal. They, just, they have to steal stuff. Well, if I turned around and said, well, you know, that's just genetic. That's the way I'm, I'm made. I, I'm a kleptomaniac. And you could argue that that's, that's in my nature. That's, that's just who I am. And in a sense, you're right. Does that make it acceptable? You know, and would that be acceptable, you know, if we went along and said, okay, 
you know, I, I am a kleptomaniac, so I'm going to come and I'm going to rob, you know, Fort Knox, and I'm going to take all the gold away, but you're going to have to allow it because I just can't help it. Would we accept that? Absolutely not. It would be morally wrong. But what's wrong with thou shalt not steal when thou shalt not commit adultery or fornication is perfectly acceptable? See, the very basis and tenet of f the fabric of society is the Ten Commandments. That's where these things are listed out. But we will pick and choose one and say, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. But then we'll pick another one and say, oh, you know, we need to do that one. And I can remember sitting in a boardroom meeting at work years ago. We had printed three uh, uh, telephone directories for the gay and lesbian community. And um, another brother that worked there, myself, kind of excused ourselves in the project and said, if you want to print that stuff, I can't stop you, but I will not be involved. And that was accepted. And we were robbed on all three of them. All three directories defaulted on payment to the neighborhood of about $100,000. So the owner of the company sat down with the management team and they went around and said, how are we going to solve this problem? What is it we're going to do to, to tackle this from happening once again? And they went around the room and they had, you know, better credit checks and, you know, maybe we should get personal collateral. Maybe we should have people sign, you know, different documents. And then I never said it worked. And finally, the owner of the company said to me, all right, Jonathan, I haven't heard from you. Tell me what you think. I said, do you really want to know what I think? He goes, I really want to know what you think. I said, seriously, you want to know what I think? And he said, yes, I do. And he says, and I know it's going to be something to do with the Bible, so just give it to me. And I said, well, look, you know, there are ten commandments, one of which this community has flagrantly disregarded. Thou shalt not commit fornication. And it's on that basis that we found the laws of this whole country. I said, that does not offend you. But when thou shalt steal comes up, because it's out of your pocket, that offends you. I said, it's the same basis of morality. My advice would be just steer away from people who have no morality. And he looked at me and he said, you're right. We will not print any more for this community whatsoever. And that was the end of it. And so, you know, but that's the situation. We, we get lost in this. And we do in our own world, brothers and sisters, in, in young people. And we just realize this is not natural. It is wrong. I mean, just science itself will teach you that if you allow this way of life, evolution will actually take place. And a whole set of people will just disappear because, you know what? They're not going to procreate. It just doesn't work that way. We're not worms, you know, we don't have this kind of different way of working about things. It just doesn't work that way. God did not create it that way. And he believes that this is dishonorable. And they exchange their natural relationships. You know, there's a concept, brothers and sisters and young people, that, well, I was just made that way. And we run into this with Christadelphian young people from time to time as well. Because we're all susceptible. We're all made of the same stuff. We're not better than this community. Some of our young people have experimented, have predilections in this direction. That's to be expected because we're all flesh. And flesh is corrupt. But if we're going to turn around to God and say, you know what? I was born a boy, but actually you got it wrong, God. I'm a girl or vice versa. This is what we're saying. We're saying... To the potter, well, this is the Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. He answered and said unto him, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? For he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. He made them male and female. That was an act of God. When we are born, we are born male or female. That is creation that has taken place in the womb. It's described that way throughout the Bible. But if we turn around and say, no, 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 God, you actually got it wrong. We are actually the, the, the clay saying to the potter, as it puts it in Isaiah 64, verse 8, Now, O Yahweh, thou art our father. We are the clay. Thou art the potter. And we are all the work of your hands. And it's like the clay saying to the potter, why have you made me the way you have made me? You got it wrong. I should have been the other gender. But that's just simply not true. And so we have it there in the words of Romans, Naoman, 
Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? So we may have feelings that lean in that direction. They're wrong feelings. I may have feelings that lean towards stealing. It's a wrong feeling. And the thing is that what we're supposed to do is not give in to the lust of the flesh. Denying ungodly lusts, fleeing youthful lusts, putting these things away. God says, turn away from that. And that's what he wants us to do. But there is deliverance. I mean, this is the God we serve. He's amazing. Because we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. So what he says is, look, you abstain from these things. And that word literally means to hold oneself off or to refrain. That's the answer to this is not to engage, not to get ourselves mixed up into these things. And he goes on to say, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in your ignorance, but as he that has called you is holy, so be you holy in all that you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So God doesn't want us to be defined by our lusts. He doesn't want us to become people that are just simply labeled because of the lust that we have. He wants us to be his children, and to do so, he says, put this stuff away. Don't let it be named amongst you. First uh, Thessalonians 4, verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, and that you should abstain from fornication, and every one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That idea of fornication is the Greek word pornea, from which we get pornography. Illicit sexual intercourse, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, and the list goes on and on. Anything that is outside of the confines of what God has defined in marriage. That's what he says. This is not the kind of people we are. We're to abstain from these things and not give in to them. And concupiscence is really the word that dis defines this era. The desire for the forbidden. And that's what the world is all about. What God has said you're not to do, the world chases and wants to be involved in. But you see, the thing is, it's possible to leave it behind. Consider 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be deceived? Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So those people, quite plainly, Paul puts it, they're not going to be in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what feelings you might have or lusts. We're told in verse 11, such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And so we have there, this point is, is that that might be where we're at at some point in our life. Maybe that's where we come from, maybe that's where people we know are at. And we don't condemn the person. The Lord Jesus Christ said to the woman, taken in adultery, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way, sin no more. Change your, your lifestyle. Repent. Turn from these things. So somebody might have that as a part of what they have to struggle with. Maybe they didn't even choose it. Maybe they were abused as a kid or whatever the background might be. The point is, Paul says, the ecclesia in Corinth, many of them had those things in their backgrounds. Such were some of you. But what can change us is the word of God. It's possible for the word of God to change you. But if we don't allow it to, then we're going to die. The world says, you know, you shall not surely die if you participate in these things. That's what the serpent said to Eve. God says, you will surely die if you participate in these things. But you can leave them behind. You can be washed and you can repent. And he goes on to say that, you know, it's back in the, in the law, actually in the prophets. 
What God does with Israel's sin, and it's the same with ours, is he tosses it behind him. As far as the east is from the west, so will he remove our iniquity from us. And that is the beauty of the message of the truth. So young people, if you have friends, if you have relatives, if you have people you work with who struggle with these things, don't be afraid to speak out and to say, look, you know, I get that's where you're at, but you can leave it behind. And the word of God can cleanse your mind. It can change who you are. And most people who struggle with things like that don't want to be that way. I mean, there are some that militantly champion it, yes, but a lot of people are just struggling. They're confused. They've been through some terrible situation, whatever it might be. And we can invite them out of it. We can invite them to leave because God can deliver people from this circumstance. And Sodom is evidence of that deliverance. Consider the words of Peter in 2 Peter 2, verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust of the day of judgment and to be punished. God can deliver the godly out of temptation. If that's the way we want to be, and we might not be godly, we might just decide that's what I want to be, and I don't really feel that way very much right now, but you start washing the mind with the water of the word, and it can change who you are. Look at the nation of Israel. If he could change them, he can change us. And so he knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And that's what we want to talk about for a couple of minutes. Because we have the evidence of the city of Sodom. And that evidence tells us a couple of things. Number one, he's true to his word. He will destroy the wicked. That's number one. That's going to happen. Judgment will come. But number two is that he can deliver the godly. And it's not a fairy tale. It's a real historical testimony. And I know this, brothers and sisters and young people, because I've been there. I have been to the city of Sodom. It has been excavated. And in all the eras of the world for them to find it, they find it today in the last 10 years, just across the border of Israel in Jordan. It's not a fairy tale. It's a real historical testimony. So let's just take a look at a couple of the things that he was saw. Turn back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. Just have these open because we're going to reference a couple of these passages. Genesis chapter 13. When Lot was with Abraham, and we'll look at this a little bit more tomorrow, in the plain of Jordan, or he lifted up, he was actually between Bethel and Ai, and he lifted up his eyes and he beheld all the plain of Jordan, and it was a well watered plain everywhere before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of Yahweh like the land of Egypt as thou comest to Zor. Now the word there um, plain is the Hebrew word kikar and literally what it means is round. Round like a pita bread or like a coin. Right so that's the idea it's a round flat area that's what the word kikar is and when you look at Sodom today and you, you take a view from Ai so we're going to come into the land of Israel. So this is the Dead Sea. Over this side here, we have the, the area of the Jordan River. And there's this whole plain that is there, and it's called the Kikar of the Jordan, the plain of the Jordan. It's kind of a circular area that's fairly flat in this area right here. That's where it sits. And Bethel and Ai are these two cities here. And when you look from here, this is what you can look at and see. Jericho's down the bottom. Here's your kind of visual plane. There's mountains on the side that block you from seeing the Dead Sea. And you look across actually to this is the plain of the Jordan. And a, an archaeologist named Dr. Um, Dr. Collins um, went and basically said, if that's the case, then we should go over to the other side of Jordan and we should look and see if we can find cities that date to this time period. And what they found was these different ones here. There's Tel Rama, Tel Aktanu, but specifically this one right here, which is Tel al Hamam, which is the biggest of the tells or the artificial man made areas in this area. There's Tel Aktanu, the five cities of the plain, and um, Tel Rama, and there's also Tel Kafrain, and, uh, and the area of what they believe is Gomorrah, which is right here. So there's Sodom, and uh, there's Gomorrah, and there's the other cities of the plain. So this is the area where the archaeologists said, look, we're going to cross the Jordan. 
We're going to find the tells, which is where people live. They always live on a hill so you can see your enemies coming. And we're going to go dig there. And that's exactly what they did. So this was the tell, tell al Hamam, looking west over the Kikar. And what they did was they started to excavate. And so they found uh, Middle Bronze Age ruins. So Middle Bronze Age dates back before Solomon. Solomon's in the Iron Age. Right, we're going back to the Middle Bronze Age, which is the time period of Abraham, around 3,500 years ago or so. And this is our group as we traverse through this area with Brother Lane Rittmeyer. Actually, he wasn't with us on this part of it. This was Brother, uh, Dr. Collins. And um, you might notice a few people there on our group. There's Brother Stan Isbell. And uh, there's a few others here that as we go through these, you might recognize them. But this is what they found. Mud bricks. This was the, the method of construction in the day. And it was basically the whole idea of taking a, a, a brick, creating it just like they did at the time of Egypt, with straw and everything else in the mud, and they'd dry it in the sun, and then they would build with it. These are the mud bricks that date from the time period of Sodom. Well, how do they know that? Well, because of the pottery that they found. I was never big on pottery. You know, we'd drive by one of those little pottery shops on the side of the road, and all of a sudden my foot would get heavier and heavier as my wife was like, oh, look, it's a pottery shop. And I'd be like, vroom, down the road we would go, right? Until we went to Sodom. And all of a sudden the interest in pottery changed because it's like Tupperware. You know, if, if you opened up a garbage landfill, and you pulled out Tupperware from like the sort of 1960s, you could tell this is a certain type of Tupperware. Or perhaps if it was like Royal Dalton China or some crazy thing like people collect those little dolls and plates and cups and whatever. Um, it, you can tell this is the Albert Edwardian era or whatever it might be because of the patterns and the shapes and the sizes. Well, that's what it was like for them. And this, this pottery dated to this time period. And, and you can see here that these are the, the bricks all kiln-fired in this area. And one of the things they found was a palace. And this is all covered up when we were there. It was the rainy season, so they didn't want them getting um, any more eroded because they dug them out from under the, the ground. And these here are mud bricks dating to that time period. And here's a closer look. You can see the strata of the mud bricks as they go up there. And there is plaster on these walls. Now, the scientists we were with, or the archaeologist, he took out some of that plaster, and um, this is actually from that very place. There's plaster from the wall. This is actually floor plaster. And um, when this structure was destroyed, it collapsed, and the roof came down. So there was the, the bottom floor, then there was the upper floor, and this is from the upper floor that collapsed onto the bottom floor. Now, if this is the city of Sodom, and in my mind, there's no doubt that it is, this palace structure would have been King Bera's palace that Lot and Abraham would have dealt with. This is the floor from the palace, and King Bera would have been walking around on that floor. And they have found that in the Jordan area today. And you can come have a look at that afterwards, because that puts you in touch with Lot and with Sodom. And so here they are as they dug through it all, uh, digging down many, many layers. They went through several layers. One of them was at the top. This is the Roman or the Iron Age layer. This is it here, a specific type of pottery. So this is from the Roman era. And there's some glazed um, pottery there. So they know that this technology did not exist in the time of Lot. That came later on. And the specific types of firings. So that's the one layer. But they kept digging down. And what they found as they dug down Below that layer was they found wells, they found houses, they found structures, basically. And you can see the, the mud brick there on the side. And then there's, they've used stones here as well. And none of these stones are cut with tools because this is prior to the Iron Age. So they didn't have the iron tools capable of chiseling away at stones. So they would use the stones as they were. They would build with them and they would use mud brick. And they found, of course, the pottery of this era. Artifacts, beginning at the Roman Age, down to the Iron Age, the time of Solomon. This is actually the city of Abel Shitta, right, which was one of the cities, the supply cities that Solomon had. There was the 12 cities. Each city would supply once a month. This is the city of the acacia trees on the other side of Jordan. It's actually where Israel would have encamped when they basically first came into the land um, before they crossed over into Gilgal. Here's one of the pots. And uh, what's fascinating about this 
is that they have a specific type of painting on them. And you can see it there as they unearth these things. This was the decoration of the day. And here's one of those pots from the middle of Bronze Age era um, that has that same kind of painting on it. And there's all kinds of things. There's cooking pots. Um, there's all kinds of different ones. This is uh, a couple of uh, cooking pots. You can actually see a cooking pot, by the way, was a good pot that had been chipped or broken. Um, so now they would bury it in the ground, uh, either use it to cook with or they would use it to store grain. Here's one that's actually been, been uh, singed, not by the destruction, but by actually being used as a cooking pot. And there's all kinds of, of things that they would dig up there. Um, there is just massive pots, different ones, uh, wine jugs, cups, um, amazing little jugs of all different des descriptions. Here is a pot uh, holder, you know, like a, a, a would go on the side of a pot so you could lift up a larger pot. And um, then there's these smaller ones that would have been cup holders. And you know, this was the city of Lot and the city of Sodom. For all we know, that could have been Lot's teacup. I mean, this is where it's from. I mean, there's huge amounts of pottery there. But this is the reality of it, brethren and sisters, is these were all there at the time, and uh, different types of designs that they would make, um, using them with the pottery wheel, bigger handles, and so on and so forth. And feel free to come and have a look at that afterwards, because that is evidence from that time period. And so all kinds of different things that they would dig up, and then they would clean them, and they would uh, bowls for the table, um, different types of cosmetic uh, bowls and, and applicators and so on. Just tons and tons of pottery, and that's where our pottery came from, is what they called the discard pile, where they can't find enough pieces to put together, so we were, we were allowed. This isn't Raiders of the Lost Ark or something. We were allowed to remove these things because they were about a, an 8 meter high by 20 meter in diameter pile of pottery. So I just asked Dr. Collins, can you give me some of the Stone Age, or not Stone Age, some of the Iron Age stuff, the, uh, the time of, of uh, Solomon, and then some of the actual Middle Bronze Age, so I, I can you know, show other people what we've got to see here. But you see, brothers and sisters, what's fascinating about this is the angels would arrive in Sodom and Gomorrah, just like the Lord will soon arrive on our doorstep or his angels, to take us from this world that we live in. They came the night before the judgment, and they came to the gate of Sodom. Well, here is the, the outline of Sodom as it's been constructed, and they came to the gate of the city, which sits on this side there. And we, we read the story of how they did it. In, in Genesis chapter 19, if you just flip over a couple of pages, there came two angels to Sodom at even, and as Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face towards the ground. He had become involved in the municipal life of the city of Sodom. Now, he had an opportunity to escape earlier. Remember when Kida Leomer came along and, you know, they took Lot and his family captive and carried them off all the way up into the north and Laish. You can look at that tomorrow. And Abraham saved him and brought him back. And he could have said, you know what, Abraham? I made a huge mistake. I'm coming with you now. And I don't care about the flocks and the herds and all that. I'm coming with you. But he didn't. He went back to Sodom. You know, a lot of times people say, well, what was it? Materialism. You know, remember Lot's wife, she looked back. Well, just remember something, brothers, sisters, and young people. It gets harder when relationships are involved. Because Lot had sons-in-law, which means he had daughters in the city, which means he probably had grandchildren as well. What would be the hardest thing for a grandmother to do? Leave the grandchildren in the city. It's not just all about materialism. I mean, certainly that was the life of Sodom. It was a very opulent place, as the archaeology proves. But the tough thing was when you involve yourself in a society and your family becomes intermixed with it, is that then when time comes to extract, it is much harder to walk away. Well, here's the wall that goes around Sodom. These are the bricks here that, that basically date back to the 3000 to 2300 BC. Here is Brother Lane Rittmeyer as they're mapping this out and saying, well, if this is the city, the gate should be approximately somewhere over here. And so they started to dig 
and they started looking for the gate of Sodom. And this is a, a construction drawing that Brother Lane did. And the gate of the city, he figured, should fall somewhere around this area. Now, we hiked all the way up the back end, and we came down here. And Dr. Collins told us, this is where we expect to dig next year, and we hope to find the gate. So there's Lane, as he went out there to kind of say, well, this is kind of where we should be digging. And the digging began, and they found this narrow passageway and this main gateway and another narrow passageway here. And the more they dug, they found the outer walls, they found benches, and uh, they were quite excited in 2012 that they'd found the gate. We were there in 2011. And so they mapped it all out and surveyed it and kept digging and digging. And this, this great complex then sort of came out. And this is what it looked like. You can see the room here. In fact, they've kind of done an overlay for us. Here is what the gate would have been like. This is where the two towers would have been. There's uh, columns that would have held the roof up here. This is the city of Sodom, the gate that Lot would have walked through, and the gate that eventually the angels would come through to rescue him out of Sodom. So you would come in here and out into the city in this direction here. right? So you come through the main gate from the outside, and there would be different doors here into the city here. An amazing situation. And there it is. So Brother Lane did a construction drawing of what they figured this looked like, and then they overlaid that onto the actual area where they found it. And this would have been something along the lines of what it would have looked like when they went to Sodom. And so there is the city of Sodom and the gate that the angels would have gone into. And houses built right in this area up hard against the wall. The entrance from the tower into these, these houses that are right there. And what's amazing is when we were there... We saw this little pot-shaped thing, and Dr. Collins said, well, what do you think that is? And we did a test with the kids what they thought it was at one of the schools he went to. This is the hinge. I mean, you've got to think this is pre-Iron Age. So how do you create a gate? Well, they have a big beam that would go down. They would hollow out a rock. They would round off the bottom of the beam, fill the area with animal fat so it could turn, build the gate off of this, and it would swing on that hinge stone. So this is the, the gate, or one of the gates, the doorpost hinge, from the city of Sodom. This is a smaller one. This probably would have been something the size of Lot's door to his house, but that's how doors worked back then. So we have all these homes, basically, that were at the terminal stage. And I'll tell you what that means in a minute. So what happens is, is in, G in Genesis 19, he pressed upon them greatly, this is the angels, and Lot, and they turned and they entered into his house, he made a feast and baked unleavened breads, and, and they did eat. So they were there for a period of time. Meanwhile, Abraham is negotiating with the angel back in Hebron. And he's distressed. Because you got to figure, you know, how many servants did Abraham have when they chased Kedileoma? Do you remember? Roughly. 300 and change armed men, right? So if every armed man has a wife and perhaps a child or two, you're dealing with a host of about a thousand people. Now, if the land was too big to hold them, or to not, not big enough, sorry, to contain them, Lot must have had at least a third of that, maybe 300 people that would have been his entourage. And out of that 300 people, Abraham starts the bidding at a pretty high number. 45, the Ecclesia of 45. Out of those 300, there's 45 brothers and sisters, right? The angel says they won't destroy it. But they keep walking. And Abraham's like, 40 brothers and sisters. I will not destroy it. And Abraham starts getting embarrassed. He says, well, 30, 20, 10. You see, this vibrant Ecclesia that it's separated from Abraham at one point in time, that Abraham numbers around 50, is whittled down to one, Lot. His, his daughters, as we know, are sodomites by heart by what goes on later on. And so there it is, brothers and sisters, that on the day that this all goes down, a terrible, terrible situation, the men have said to Lot, look, the city's going to get destroyed. Do you have here besides sons-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters? Whatever you've got, bring it out of the city. And uh, all he could find, he, he spoke unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. So you've got, obviously, other families there. Told them to get out of the place because Yahweh was going to destroy it. 
And they thought, oh, he's a joker. You know, this is just a joke. He seemed as one that mocked to his sons-in-law. And what that teaches us, brethren, sisters, and young people, is what it says in Corinthians, this is the NIV. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. If we make ourselves at home with the world, it's going to corrupt us. It did his family. He had sons-in-law. At least two daughters then were married. Two daughters are still in the house, and his wife and him. And of course, we know the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, remember Lot's wife. They're there to serve as a reminder to us. So we read in Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. When the morning rose, the angels hastened, Lot, arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. But he lingers. Well, of course he lingers. His family's there. And they laid hold on his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hand of his two young daughters, Yahweh being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. God was merciful to Lot. They told him to get out, and he wouldn't go. So they dragged him out of the city. Because God was merciful to him. Because Lot, even though he lived amongst them, was vexed by this. And so it was... Yeah, as we read in Genesis 20, 19, 23, when the sun was risen upon the earth, Lot entered into Zoar. Then Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, and Yahweh, or from Yahweh out of heaven. He overthrew the cities of the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that grew up upon the, which, and, and, sorry, and everything that grew upon the ground. So it was all destroyed. But of course, his wife looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. So she looked back. She turned back. Her heart was in that city. And we have to ask the question, brothers and sisters, well, what about us? What in our lives today holds us back? Now, it's going to be different for you than it is for me. Solomon calls it everybody's plague of his heart. We all have something that stands between us and the kingdom of God, something that holds us back. Don't let that be what destroys us, because that's what happened to Lot's wife. It held her back. So in the same day, the Lord says that, you know, Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be when the Son of Man is revealed. And so he says in that day, uh, he which is on the housetop and the stuff in the house, don't let him come down and take it away. He that is in the field, let him likewise not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. It's not about the stuff. I mean, our lives are so much in this material world just coming out of Christmas, all about stuff, right? It's all about hoarding of stuff. That's not a man's life, the Lord says, is not consistent in the abundance of things that he owns. So this is a grave warning to us, brothers and sisters, to remember Lot's wife. And it is a real rewinder. Because you see, when they dug up Sodom, they found mud brick hard filed, hard fired, like it had been in a kiln, right? The estimated temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius. That's how hot it was in the city. Now, you could burn this hall to the ground. You're not going to get anywhere near that temperature. It's a huge hot temperature. In fact, this is a roof uh, that is fired um, and infused with sulfur dating to the Middle Bronze Age. In fact, they actually found pottery with something on the back of it, which was like glaze. And it's sand that has been melted and turned into like a glaze, like glass. And they sent it to the university in um, Trinity uh, State University and said, could you analyze this, this, con this substance for us? And not telling them what it was. Oh, they said, this is desert glass from Nevada from when they set off the nuclear bombs there back in the 1940s and 50s. No, it was pottery from Tel Al Hammam. And they called it Trinitite because that's the name basically that they give to the stuff that's been hard fired with sand infused to it. And there's some of the desert glass that was found four kilometers away from Tel Al Hammam. And brothers and sisters, it's not cunningly devised fables. What you're looking at there is ash. So here's the, the ground over top that they've been digging down. There is a meter of ash between the top layer and the ground floor here. 
Now, years ago, we went up to uh, the Yukon, and we were there after one of these massive fires. Of, I think it was like a million hectares of land which was burned. And we drove for days going through this mass. You could see it from space. We were there a year later. It was still smoldering. And we walked out in what had been an absolutely massive forest. The ash was this deep. Not only is that the forest, but like there's all that undergrowth that burned as well. It was only knee deep. That was it. Well, this is a meter of 3,500-year-old compacted ash that has caused this. So this is a huge, massive explosion, much more than just a burning of a city. One meter a layer of ash. And it's there all the way through. These are the pictures that we took when we were there, and this is the ash layer. And you can see the difference um, in the color here. Uh, right there, it's more of a grayish color, this, this ash layer as it sits underneath the sand. And so there is this, this ash layer, and they've actually built over top of it in years gone by. So a time of Solomon, they've come along, and they've built over top, and the Romans as well. But it's not just that, brothers and sisters. It's what they found buried in the ash. Because what this archaeologist here is doing is finding bones. And you would expect to find bones in a city. But the difference is, that these bones are not found like a typical city that's been invaded, where people have been killed by spears and the spearheads and, and stone spearheads or arrowheads or anything like that. There's none of that. There are just bones that are all over the place, skeletal remains in the ash layer, especially at the bottom of the ash layer. And not only that, but they are in a specific way. They're all kind of pointing in a certain direction. And one of the doctors that was there um, with Dr. Collins basically was an explosion expert from the Army. And um, he would go in forensically and would look at, you know, after an explosion. And he said, this is typical human bone scatter from an explosion because everything is polarized and pointing in the same direction. So an explosion has taken place and all these bones have been pointed out. Not only that, but this is the leg of somebody who died. And just notice down the bottom there. That skeletal remain from the terminal Bronze Age has toes in what they call the hyperflex. So, I don't know if you're like me, probably not, but if somebody throws a ball at me, my peripheral vision is not that good. So unless it's coming right at me, I'm immediately doing this, right? Because I'm going to get hit because I can't kind of calculate it. And what do you do? You scrunch your toes up. This person's leg was severed when their toes were scrunched up about to be impacted by something. And that's how they were burned um, and killed. And you can see up here, charred femur ends. So this leg was severed from this person um, at that very point in time. Hyperflex toes, bone scatter, uh, charred femur ends. And that's just a blow up of it where you can see. But the question the scientists were asking was, well, where's the rest of the body? Um, it was nowhere to be found because there was this great explosion that had taken place. And they believe, actually, that it was some kind of a meteorite that possibly came down and exploded above the city and basically caused this massive uh, furnace um, firing uh, fire from heaven, basically. But the good news is that Lot was delivered. He delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked, that righteous man, dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexes righteous soul day to day with their unlawful deeds. God delivered him, which means he rescued or he drew him to himself. And young people and brothers and sisters, this is the fact. God knows how to do this. Let's just take a look at Romans 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh sold under sin. This is the problem of all of us. I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing that I hate, that's what I end up doing. For I know that in that my flesh, nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh, for I have the desire to do that what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what, is keep, what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do, do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find there's a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. 
For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's the problem. And all of us feel that at times. I want to do the right thing. I know what the right thing is, and I end up doing the wrong thing. And Paul says that's because your human nature, sin, dwells in you. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came, to put it to death. And when we agree with that, we are reconciled to God. That's part of the process. And so we read in Jeremiah 17, this is the facts. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who? Well, God. He says, I search the heart. I know the reins. I try every man, uh, give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his, of his doings. The Lord Jesus Christ knew it. He says, from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, that's that word pornea again, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, that's unbridled lust, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man and a woman and a boy and a girl and an older person and a younger person, it doesn't matter, we're all made of the same stuff. But we're not alone because the Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what we're dealing with. Hebrews 4 tells us, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy to find help, uh, and, and to find grace to help in time of need. So brothers, sisters, and young people, that is the situation, that is the way out. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. He knows exactly what this flesh is all about. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. That's our nature. He's put it to death. Why? So he can deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the good news is, brothers and sisters and young people, that there is a way out of this. God can deliver us out of this. And the way out is with the word. We read in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the ecclesia and gave himself for it. How? What did he do? He washed it, he sanctified it, he cleansed it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what the power of God can do in your life. You do not need to be a victim of Sodom. You do not need to be a victim of the world and those evil things that vex our souls when we see and we hear them. We need to get the word into our minds and wash our minds with the water of the word so that we can be, through the power of the, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, holy and without blemish. You will fail. You will trip up. You will fall back into a muddy puddle. Get up and believe that your God is able to deliver you. See, Abraham was 100 years old. He was completely past chance of having a child. But he believed that what God had promised he was able to perform Brothers, sisters, and young people, what God has promised us is that he will, in fact, change us, that he will sanctify us, and he will wash us. The verse I wanted to look up is in Philippians. This is, this is our last passage. Philippians chapter 1. Our confidence is not in ourselves, but it's in the ability of God to complete the job. He has chosen every single one of us. He's called us to himself, and he's given us the word. He's given us the power of God to salvation. That we have the word that can create in us faith, that it can create in us hope and desire to do things that God wants us to do, people, be people he wants us to be. And if we fall and fail along the way, we have to get up and trust that he can complete in us the work he's begun. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, he which has begun a good work in you, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. If you're here, then God has begun 
at work in you. And your confidence is not in yourself. It's not self-confidence. It's useless. It's confidence that God can complete the work. That he can indeed deliver the godly out of the situation of Sodom. But also to remind us of Lot's wife and of the children that were killed in the city of Sodom. The choice is ours. Deliverance or destruction.